Welcome everybody to Hutch at Home, um, our new series uh, that brings speakers from Fred Hutch um, into your home. And we're super excited today uh, to host Molly McDonald from the Emmerman Lab to talk about HIV, a story of cross-species transmission. And um, hopefully, can you see the slide that says quick reminders? Did it advance? Um, no. Okay, I'm gonna it's try, I'm gonna do this again. I don't know why I, my screens have such a hard time with the PowerPoint. Okay. It wouldn't be a Zoom um, meeting without some technical difficulty though, right? So. Let's go. Meanwhile, we have a few other people joining us, but that's great. Okay. And so weird, it's saying it's paused and I can't resume it. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share out of this other window. There we go. Um, so you can see the screen that says quick reminders. Yeah, we can see the presenter view. Yeah, okay. So um, just quick reminders, please mute yourself if you're not talking and um, we'll have one or two pauses for you to provide general feedback via the participants window. And um, we will again have a feedback form at the end of the talk um, if you'd like to, to give us some feedback. Okay, so in the participant window um, where we do a pause, uh, you can, or even just at any time, um, if there's um, uh, something where you are hoping that we go a little faster or go a little slower, you can indicate that to us. And in the more button, um, you can also uh, applaud or <laughs> give, give your thumbs um, up or down. Okay, and so I also wanted to acknowledge that Molly was just um, elected as one of the Husky 100, which is a great honor. And we're so super proud that um, the Husky uh, 100 recognized her and her work uh, as an exceptional student. So that's um, part of why we're so delighted to have her here today. And I'm going to stop uh, sharing now and turn it over to Molly. Awesome, thank you so much. Let me load up my slides. So I'm really excited to talk to you guys about um, my work um, that I've done since joining um, my PhD program and working in the Emmerman lab. Um, it, SEP has been a huge part of my graduate school journey. Um, I actually wrote part, most of my essay is on, for the Husky 100. Um, it's all about the Fred Hutch, but a lot of it is on my um, experience working with SCP teachers and how they've shaped um, how I can take what I've been learning at the bench um, uh, beyond um, just the confines of the lab. So I'm excited this year um, to be doing something a little bit different with um, this Hutch at Home series. So like Jeannie said, uh, my name is Molly McDonald. I am a fifth year graduate student um, and, I'm, and I'm a part of the molecular and cellular biology program, PhD program at UW. Um, so this program is an interdisciplinary program between the UW and the Fred Hutch. And so even though my degree is from UW, I actually do all my thesis work in a lab at the Fred Hutch. And that lab is Michael Emmerman's lab, um, a part of the human biology division. And I also have a science Twitter, it's at Molly Goes Viral, um, that I occasionally post some things on if you are interested. So today, again, I'm gonna talk about the stories of cross-species transmission, um, HIV. But before I get into that, um, I just wanted to kind of start off with uh, my motivation for science. So 
Um, I am originally from Texas. I grew up in Houston. And when I was in around, or when I was in sixth grade, my grandmother was diagnosed with um, very late stage uh, breast cancer. And she was about 80 years old. And so um, things weren't looking super great for her. But my parents were really, really optimistic um, and decided to have her, she lived in Maryland at the time, and so have her come and live with us um, so she could um, get treatment at a cancer center, sort of similar to the Fred Hutch um, called MD Anderson. And so she came and she lived with us and um, she got her treatment at MD Anderson. And so she actually survived her breast cancer, which is amazing. And it was due to a drug that she was able to be a part of a phase three clinical trial. So the drug is now commonly used and it's Herceptin. But at the time, um, this drug had yet to be FDA approved. And at a very early age, I was able to learn that um, she had, you know, you can have really great physicians and that can really impact um, your health but also there needs to be um, basic science research and um, research in general um, for new drug discovery. And so I've kind of always been, because of that experience, I have been interested in pursuing science. Um, since moving from Houston, uh, or after Houston, we, my parents moved to Louisiana. So for high school, I went to school in Louisiana and I, um, I didn't really have a great high school science teacher. Um, science for me was taught out of a textbook and you came to class, you read the textbook and you left. So this um, story and this picture here of me and my grandmother, I recently found it when I was digging through my uh, quarantine uh, memorabilia at extra time um, has really been my motivator um, throughout my science um, path. So, um, for college, I decided I wanted to go to a university that had a really strong undergrad research program. And I also still wanted to be close to family. So I ended up deciding to go to Rice University, which is in Houston. Um, so I graduated from Rice with a degree in biochemistry and cell biology. And while I was there, I did um, undergraduate research uh, project on plants. The specific plant is called Arabidopsis, which I'm showing a picture of here. Arabidopsis is kind of like a weed. And while my project was interesting, I, I really did want to work on something that was more uh, related to human disease. And I also happened to be allergic to this plant. So uh, working with it wasn't ideal. So I applied for graduate school PhD programs across the US. And I ultimately decided to uh, move across the US to Seattle. And so now I am uh, uh, soon, I guess I'll be graduating relatively soon with a PhD from UW in molecular and cellular biology. And I have joined Michael Emmerman's lab at the Hutch. And my whole project is focused on HIV in the innate immune system. And that's kind of what we'll be talking about today. I'm gonna occasionally check the uh, chat to try to monitor it myself. So yeah, we'll let you know if there's something. Great, great, that's even better. Okay, um, sorry, so next, let's see. Just wanna broadly um, talk about the immune system. And I know last um, session there was a great talk on the immune system as well, but just to reorient everyone, um, there are two major classifications of the immune system, the innate immune system here on the left and the adaptive immune system on the right. And here I'm just trying to compare and contrast a couple of points. So the innate immune system is encoded um, by your genome. So it's germline encoded and versus the adaptive immune system is created in response to a, sp a pathogen. Because of this, the adaptive immune system is going to be a very specific response versus the innate immune system is going to be much broader and nonspecific. But 
the innate immune system is going to be rapid in your first response versus the adaptive um, immune system is a slow response because it takes um, some time to create this very specific um, response. And the last point is um, the innate immune system is inheritable. So again, this is important because it's, um, it's germline encoded versus the adaptive um, immune system is generally not passed on to offspring. So for example, um, antibodies are a great um, um, example of the adaptive immune system. So antibody is made um, in reaction to a very specific pathogen. And I'm showing that here with these uh, traditional antibody cartoons. And I do want to note one um, exception is mother to infant um, antibodies. Um, some mother can pass on their antibodies to their um, infants. In addition, the, ex or the example for the innate immune system um, is shown here. So this is a immune cell. And in response to a pathogen, it is releasing a signaling molecule to alert the immune system to help take uh, clear this foreign object. Well, my work is actually focused over here on the innate immune system. So I'm interested in the innate immune system in the context of HIV. So I know everyone has um, a, a pandemic on their mind, and it might not be this one, but HIV is still a huge global burden. Um, and so HIV, or human immunodeficiency virus, um, is going to be demonstrated here in this heat map. So the global prevalence is still enormous. So we have about 80, I mean, sorry, 38 million people living with HIV globally and about 1.7 million new infections. And this um, is coming from data that was acquired in 2018. But um, as you can see here, the darker colors are areas that have greater um, people living with HIV. And um, I wanted to draw your attention to Africa where we can see there are lots of people that are infected with HIV. And this is actually where the virus originated. So the virus, um, originated due to a cross-species transmission. And so I want to talk about that here. So HIV, which is human immunodeficiency virus, um, I'm going to kind of backtrack in how we know um, where it came from, but first start off um, over here on the left and talk about old world monkeys and how they are infected with their own species-specific um, HIV-like virus. Um, it's called simian immunodeficiency virus, or SIV. So here the silhouettes show different monkeys, and below it will be SIV and then a short um, abbreviation for the monkey. So this is an African green monkey, and this um, African green monkeys are infected with SIV HEM. Now, um, when we backtrack and try to figure out where HIV came from, we actually know it was a result, it resulted from four independent transmissions to humans. So HIV, it actually originated from SIV CPZ or SIV chimpanzee. So we got the virus from, um, from chimpanzee. So it jumped from chimps into humans twice. And then from, it went from chimps into gorillas and then from gorillas into humans twice. So four arrows here are showing four independent transmissions into humans, and one of which is responsible for the pandemic. Furthermore, we can actually trace back this, uh, the history of this virus to um, old world monkey. So there is a virus um, that was infecting red cat mangabees here and mustache guinans. These two viruses combined together and infected chimps, and this virus was known as SIV CPZ. Okay. So now that we've talked about HIV on a um, macroscopic level, I wanted to get in the microscopic level. 
So well, there was if, one question that did come oh. up in the chat. So do we know how do we know which one of the four transmissions was the one that started the pandemic? Oh, that's an awesome question. Mm -hmm. We do. Um, it came from originally chimpanzees. So it's um, so it's one of these two that I'm uh, simplified here with an arrow. It came from a chimp. Okay. So HIV is actually a retrovirus. It belongs to the retrovirus family. Retro meaning backwards because it describes the flow of information from RNA back to DNA. Um, so via this um, specific enzyme called reverse transcriptase. So I find this to be particularly cool because um, it wasn't until college that I learned um, that there could be something that wasn't a part of the central dogma. I always was taught DNA makes RNA makes protein, but what I found so interesting about HIV is that you go from RNA and using this specific enzyme called reverse transcriptase, you go from RNA into DNA. And so here I also sometimes use the word virion and just wanted to define that means one complete infectious virus particle. So speaking of, here is a picture of an HIV virion. It's very small. So the diameter on average is 120 nanometers across. So, and it's jam packed. Um, I'm gonna point out a couple of the characteristics. So the first thing is um, the outside, you can kind of see these little lollipops or spikes. These are called, um, or it's called HIV envelope. Um, this is really important because it actually docks a virion into the host cell when it's trying to infect a cell. Something else that really sticks out is this cone-like shape found in the inside. This is called HIV capsid. Capsid is kind of like a shield. What it does is inside it contains the genetic material, but it's trying to guard the genome from the host so that way it's unrecognizable and it doesn't get um, like removed by the host. And then of course, inside this uh, capsid will be the RNA genome. Can't really see it. There's a question, is that picture just one virion then? Yes, this is just one virion. And so now taking this picture, I'm going to use now a cartoon form to talk about the HIV life cycle. So here is our cartoon virion. On the outside, we have the envelope. And here's my best attempt to make this similar cone shape, uh, capsid. And inside is the genetic material, which is RNA. And so here, when things are RNA, I'm gonna color them green. And when it's DNA, I'm coloring it uh, blue. So when this virion finds a target cell that it wants to, wants to infect, that it infects, it will bind to the cell and uncoat. So um, what happens is it deposits its genetic material into the cell and this capsid starts to break down. So I'm showing that here with um, dotted lines. Now we have the RNA that's hanging out in the cytoplasm of this cell and this RNA needs to go into DNA. So this process is called reverse transcription, um, which is, happens here. And this process is very error prone. In fact, every single time that HIV copies its genome, there's one mistake made, which is pretty incredible. Um, so after that, once we have two, this DNA made, it's a double-stranded DNA, it's going to import into the nucleus, which I'm showing here. This DNA gets integrated into the host genome um, in an area that actually is undergoing active transcription. So when the cell naturally goes under um, transcription process, it will start copying the HIV. And so then we'll, we'll get active transcription and translation and new viruses will get ready uh, to assemble and bud and infect a new cell. So there's a question, 
uh, why cartoon of two strands of RNA, but only one strand getting reverse transcripted? Yes, that's a great question. So each, each virion contains two copies of RNA. And the process is a little bit more um, complicated, but basically what happens is these two strands of RNA can um, recombine or twist to add even more um, mutations and diversity. So um, I've just drawn it as one here, but it is something um, I'm glad you guys noticed. In re Sorry, Jeannie, were you going to say something? In reality, it's only one strand that's getting transcribed. So um, the two strands of RNA, um, so there are two per virion, and these uh, strands can, or these strands are used to add more diversity. Um, because they recombine or they um, twist into each other, if you will. But at the end, all that is um, happens is you get this double-stranded DNA product. Okay, well, it's a good place now because I just wanted to do a couple of take-homes on this HIV life cycle. So one is that this is an RNA virus. Um, but we go from RNA into DNA. And during that process, there are tons of mutations, or there are mutations that are made, sorry, at least one per round of replication. Additionally, this um, HIV integrates into the genome. So that actually is a real problem because a viral DNA can be indistinguishable from the host DNA once it's integrated. So, um, and the last part is that the cell remains infected for the duration of, um, of its lifetime. So we can't really, we can't get this HIV out until the cell dies. And so these facts, um, primarily the mutation and the integration component, make it such that finding a, or creating a vaccine or a cure for HIV has been really difficult in our field. Um, so there's a couple uh, questions. How does the nuclear membrane allow new DNA into the nucleus? And also uh, somebody who's unclear on the role of cell and nuclear membrane coats and the infection. Yeah, let me do the first one and then see if I answer both or not. Okay, so the question is, how does the DNA go from the cytoplasm into the nucleus, I believe? And that is like the hottest question right now in HIV, because that would be a great way to try to stop this infection. And so uh, we do know that um, HIV hijacks um, some host proteins to take advantage of them, dock to the nucle nuclear pores, and um, insert its genetic material. But aside from that, the specifics um, are still, still remain to be identified. And then the second then one, I don't remember the, other one. the second one was uh, the role of the me various membrane cell and nuclear um, in terms of coat, the coats and the infection. Like uh, what, what role it plays? Mary, maybe um, if it, you could clarify a little bit more on the question. Yeah, you can unmute cool. yourself that, or I can unmute you. Mary, Hi, you're sorry. Thanks for taking this question. Of course. So just, you know, with the uh, external parts of this virus, mm. um, with the, and I may, I may not be using the right terminology, but it, am I thinking about this correctly? So the, the, out, the outermost part of the virus originates from an infected cell membrane. Is that correct? Yes, that's absolutely correct. And um, maybe sort of showing here, when a virion does go to bud, it takes on part of the host cell here. And then what, what is the, how does that allow it to, or what role does that play in infecting other cells? I mean, mm -hmm. like I can understand how it plays a role in evading the immune system in terms of 
you know, it, it takes on kind of a stealthy nature at that point. But what, what part of that diagram belongs to the virus itself and what part um, is represented by what it took from the cell membrane? Yeah, that's a really great question. And um, so the host cell is going to be this outer part. The lipid bilayer layer comes from the host. But the spikes here, the envelope is encoded by um, the virus. So the virus um, adds these additional um, proteins into this lipid bilayer to help facilitate it to infect a new cell. But you're, you are right, it is helpful that there are other components um, from the cell membrane, so it's not easily recognized by the um, innate immune system. Okay, thank you. No problem. Great question. Okay. So, let's see. Um, now tying back in the innate immune system, we did get a little bit into that, but the innate immune system encodes for proteins that we call restriction factors that can inhibit viral replication. Um, I'm showing these restriction factors here against HIV, but they also can work against other viruses because they're uh, very broadly acting. So here, now I'm adding that every step that we kind of talked about uh, for the most part has a restriction factor that um, is working um, in some, some capacity to try um, to inhibit this viral replication. And this would be awesome and great for us, except, H um, oh, I did wanna point out one thing. The word restriction factor that I'm using here as an antiviral protein is different than restriction enzymes, which we know are often used. Um, and I just wanna make sure that everyone's clear here, I'm talking about an antiviral protein. Um, and that's what I'll be talking about throughout the rest of this talk. Okay, so restriction factors would be awesome at blocking replication. However, HIV encodes for proteins that counteract this, these blocks. So, I'm going to show that here with these orange dots, but in addition to this simplified cartoon, this virion has other proteins that want to stop um, the restriction factors from working. So this comes into where my thesis work and my project has started. So um, I have been trying to create a super restriction factor. Um, and we define that as an evolution guided variant of a naturally found antiviral protein with improved properties. And basically what I'm trying to do is look at evolution um, and look at see what nature has already done and try to see if we can make any of these restriction factors better. And how I'm trying to make them better, ideally, obviously they should be more antiviral or mo more potent but it would be really awesome if they also were resistant to the viral um, countermeasures that HIV poses. So again, I'm just doing a, a little silly superhero cartoon for showing my super restriction factor. And then we'll be trying to now counteract my HIV virion. And to go more specific, um, I am interested in studying a family of proteins. They are called the ApoBex. Um, ApoBex inhibit the process of reverse transcription. So here it's the um, restriction factor now with purple. And what ApoBex do is during this process of um, going from RNA to DNA, it mutates the DNA. So the DNA doesn't encode for the HIV genome, but now it has extra nonsense in there. So these ApoBex insert, um, they change the nucleotides. So um, the nucleotides were supposed to be a G, but now they have an A. And so what basically this does is it causes leading to a mismatch. And now when HIV, um, the genome isn't going to be the same. 
So now we've created even more mutations. We had a quick question about whether restriction factors were unique to HIV or there's other um, viruses also have them. Yeah, so they are not unique to HIV. They were traditionally um, like or classically discovered for HIV. So um, they are often associated, but these restriction factors work towards other viruses as well. Okay, so ApoBex. Um, ApoBex also are a family of proteins. So, oh, and these ApoBex would be really great, um, but HIV encodes a protein called BIF, and BIF um, gets rid of all the ApoBex. And so I'm showing it as a pac orange Pac-Man here. Um, so the ApoBex are ineffective, the naturally found ones. So just to dive in a little bit more, ApoBex are a family of restriction factors. That means there's um, more than one of them. And I'm showing that here, it's a cartoon. So this here is a gene um, locus in a cartoon form. So on, in humans, on chromosome 22, you'll find the seven ApoBex that I'm showing here. So ApoBex A, B, C, D, F, G, and H. And I have just depicted each protein or gene, if you will, as this um, square, square. And so these seven restrict, um, ApoBex have varying ability to degrade um, or to inhibit HIV. And so I'm showing that with a simple plus and minus here on the bottom. But um, what I wanted to do, so I had a couple of observations, but um, one of which is that these ApoBex 3D, F, and G, are really potent at inhibiting HIV, and they also have uh, two domains. So I should have said this earlier, but the two blocks show that the gene itself duplicated, so it's twice as big. So I showed the cartoon with two different blocks. But it's interesting that apobec 3 c here doesn't inhibit HIV very well and only is single domain. So, for my project, I wanted to see, can I make ApoBec 3C even better by duplicating it so it looked like what evolution has done with these other ApoBecs that are potent against HIV over here. So my hypothesis was that A3C duplication protein, which I call A3C, A3C, will have even more antiviral activity against HIV than just A3C alone. There was a question about what's going on with H. Yeah, H is a really good question. Uh, or it's an interesting protein. There is a common form, and our lab has actually done lots of work on this, and um, it was also discovered in our lab. So ApoBec 3H is really interesting. The most common form of ApoBec 3H is not antiviral. So that's why I have a minus here. Um, but there is a variant circulating in certain populations. So some people have a form of ApoBec 3H that's more antiviral. And so that is what um, it's shown here as a plus plus. So there's two different forms um, circulating. Okay, so um, I wanted to talk about how you get to work with HIV. And so our lab uses a cell culture model to test our hypothesis. And um, we use T cell lines because T cells are the cells that um, HIV infects. And these cells are immortalized. They came from a leukemia patient previously. Um, we have different lab spaces that have varying levels of safety and training required. For example, we have one lab where we work on, uh, where we can work with the least level, uh, least amount of like safety and training, where we can work with bacteria and proteins. Um, we also have another lab where we can work with cells and small parts of the virus, little components. And then if we want to work with full length or the entire HIV, we have a separate lab. 
And so on the picture on the uh, left, I worked with Anna this past summer and she's working in our uh, tissue culture room working and you can see here, um, she's working with cells. Um, to work in this facility, we wear a lab coat and gloves, um, and we have two of these um, in our lab space. But this is what my bench looks like normally. Um, I, this is where I will work with bacteria. Um, we use E. coli to grow up our plasmids that we use, so that will be done here. I run Western blots, which you can maybe see here to look at protein levels, um, different solutions and pipettes and stuff are, are kept on this bench. So it's kind of our dirty, least sterile bench space. Um, then if I wanna work in the HIV lab, we have a special, we call it the HIV lab because it's a special room. And so um, this is a picture of the door and here's a picture of Michael and two of our uh, graduate students in our lab gowning up. So um, in order to work in this lab, you have to go through a couple of trainings as well as um, some extensive shadowing. And uh, we wear two pairs of gloves, a gown. Um, right now we're wearing also a face mask, but um, goggles and yeah, your legs and everything needs to be covered. So on the inside of this door, so you can see over here on the left, um, this is how you would actually enter the HIV lab. So right here where the store is, is a hallway. They're gowning up in the inside, and then you go through this door. And so you can see there's a window um, that I'm taking this picture from. And inside the HIV lab, we actually have like a complete second lab inside. So we have biosafety uh, cabinets here to sterilely work with different cells. We have um, incubators. Microscopes is what they're actually looking at. Um, we have freezers, we have everything. So it's actually a real privilege because, to work in this lab space because we have to essentially duplicate the lab inside of this, um, inside of this space. And so I just, uh, I found when I was looking through this, a cool video of Michael is, our PI is showing two other graduate students how to look for cells that are infected with HIV. Play it one more time. Okay, so I went into the HIV lab. I performed an HIV infection assay um, to look at how antiviral these restriction factors are. And now I'm going to show you some data. So um, the data is shown here, where on the x axis, are the different conditions that I used. So here I had no apobex, so there's no restriction factor to inhibit. So here we have 100% of the cells that are gonna be infected with HIV. I added apobex in a separate condition, added apobex 3C. Here it's been established that this, is, this restriction factor poorly inhibits um, HIV. And then I have my new protein, apobex 3, um, A3C, A3C here, and this is my experimental control, and I'm excited to see what happens. On the y-axis here, um, this is the percent of cells infected with HIV. So the higher the bar, the more infection there is. So the better restriction factor will be found lower. So sometimes that's counterintuitive. So first, um, I just want to walk through a couple of them. So no, a no APOBEC. We found that there's 100% infection. So this data set is um, set to 100% infection. And when we look at A3C, oops, there's about 85% um, of the cells still have HIV. So this is what we say A3C weakly inhibits HIV-1. And when I tested my A3C, A3C new protein, we found that this protein is um, even more antiviral than just A3C, the normal kind. So this is really exciting. And the first hint that A3C, A3C is a super restriction factor. But as we um, know from the earlier slides that HIV encodes 
um, a countermeasure to get around the apobex. So in order for this to be something that would be really exciting, it would be really great if it also um, could get around VIF, the viral antagonist. So now what I'm adding to this graph in orange is a HIV that has VIF here. So there's, um, we see 100% of, of infection with cells that have no apobec. And A3C, because VIF um, is able to degrade all the naturally found apobex, we now see that there's 100% of the cells are infected with HIV. But what was really cool and really exciting is that when we tested my new A3C, A3C protein, it actually was resistant to HIV VIF. So rather than seeing 100% um, infection or something up high, there is almost no difference when you add VIF to the equation. So this is really exciting. And I have been working on this work for, like I said, almost five years now. Um, most of this research was recently published and um, I am now working on trying to better understand why these apobacs that have two domains are so much better than apobacs that have one. But this is just one small story of all the research, the HIV related research that's happening at the Hutch. Um, for example, we actually have the HIV vaccine trials network that happens. And so this is just a screenshot of their webpage, but um, I encourage you if you're interested, if you look up Fred Hutch HIV research, there's a whole page showing all the different faculty that have really cool projects um, trying to get at better understanding and curing HIV. Okay, so I just wanted to end with a comparison because um, it's on everyone's mind, but just to summarize HIV, and then I'd like to just do a quick, quick comparison to SARS-CoV-2 or, or the novel coronavirus we've been all thinking about. So in summary, um, HIV is an RNA virus, but it goes from RNA into DNA. And when it makes this DNA, it integrates it into the host cell to create this lifelong infection. Um, HIV is transmitted through needles, blood, mother to infants, as well as sexual contact. And as we learned today, that it resulted from a cross-species transmission from chimps to humans. So the virus that was infecting chimps jumped into humans and was able to adapt to humans and create a persistent infection. And so I'm not a coronavirus uh, or coronavirologist, but I um, will say that SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus similar to HIV, but a much larger RNA virus. And it does its entire replication in the cytoplasm. Um, unlike HIV, SARS-CoV-2 is a, an acute infection. Although it is interesting because uh, when, we first, when HIV was first discovered, it was um, thought to be an acute infection as well. Um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, has respiratory transmission and um, has been, uh, came originally from bats. So there was a jump from bats into humans, which led to this pandemic. And I think that's a great one way to transition into next um, science at home. Um, Dr. Ali Black, recent Dr. Ali is going to, has done some really cool work in trying to um, understand how, or track different viruses. And so, um, I'm not sure what she's going to talk about, but she's a great speaker, so I encourage you to go. But um, like I said, before I completely end this, um, the SEP time has been a huge um, influence in my uh, scientific career. And so I was digging through some pictures of the lab and I found um, this picture. This is from last summer. Um, I have Nick, our postdoc, Danielle, post baccalaureate student. Anna was visiting us, and this is her awesome poster. Um, Michael, our mentor, the head of the lab, and then Suzanne, our technician. And we were just really excited to have Anna uh, show us her work. And then I even found an older picture, and you can tell because everyone is so close to each other outside of the Fred Hutch. This is uh, when Catherine Wallace worked in our lab. Here um, we are doing at the summer annual picnic 
And so this is Lisa, a former technician who's now in graduate school, who also loves to participate in SEP. But um, here's a picture of everyone who's been trained in our lab. So Michael's sitting here in the middle, but um, Emmerman Lab turned 30 this past summer and Michael brought back all of his trainees and we had a wonderful couple days learning about where everyone's gone and what everyone's been doing. And so he is a fantastic mentor and I wouldn't have had such an awesome time in graduate school if it wasn't for his leadership. So with that, um, if you have any more questions, I'd love to take them via chat and um, share with me or I've also shared some contact information um, if you ever have any follow-up questions. Hey, yeah, we have um, just a, a little over 10 minutes for questions. So we can take some questions now either in the chat or um, if you want to, uh, it, it looks like they took away the hand in Zoom now. So if you have um, a question, maybe you can hit the, the yes um, button and uh, we'll also um, get to you that way. So there's one question in the chat that says, could you explain the part where the SIV from two different species um, infected chimps. How does the combination of viruses happen? Yes, so I, the hi current hypothesis that we have for that um, is that these chimps actually eat the other monkeys. <laughs> and so I um, believe the best hypothesis we have is that because of these, um, because of that, the two viruses were close enough into contact that they're able to, and they're similar enough to recombine. But I do know the reason we know this is because we can um, find sort of fossils of the two old world monkeys genetic components inside of the chimpanzee. It's a very close um, makeup and that work was actually also done um, in our lab as well. Wow. Um, other questions? Go either in the chat or. Oh, I just found the chat. <laughs> Thank you, Jeannie, for helping me. <laughs> no worries. There's a lot of different windows and things, so it can get confusing. So talk about how, so you're, the lab has worked on a lot of different things, it sounds like. So what, what other kinds of things is the lab working on? Yeah. Um, so our lab has been, is now working, we have kind of an interesting new endeavor. We're working a little bit on HIV latency or this idea that um, we're trying to find um, where HIV is hiding in these cells. So there, um, we have a bunch of new experiments and Michael just got a really great grant to help fund that. So we, we currently have some projects that are looking into HIV in that regard. Um, we also have projects in our lab. So other people are trying to make super restriction factors as well, just taking other um, restriction factors as an example. And yeah, those are the kind of like big main projects that we have going on. Okay, the um, question, what happened to the other three viruses that entered humans? Oh yeah, that's a great question. So they, they're still um, around. It's just, they're less pathogenic. Um, and so what that means is like, there's just less people that are infected with them. And so we see them um, in um, African populations, but they haven't like made it into a pandemic. I also see a question. Uh, oh, never mind. I think I answered that one. Yeah, that is an early. Oh, one. yeah, you did. You've been helping me with this. Okay. You see, oh, you see it now? How do There's I a new one. Yes, I've gotten this now. <laughs> Thank you, Jeannie. Um, I, I'm not sure what I'm actually going to do when I graduate. I think right now I'm interested in uh, kind of going back to my roots of um, drug discovery and what kind of got me motivated in science. So I have been looking at trying to work at a local biotech in town. Um, I also, I haven't completely given up. If I were to keep um, staying 
at um, in academics. I want to actually switch to a different virus. I have now more, I guess, more passionate about um, mosquito-borne viruses. I think they're going to be the new big, um, big hit, if you will, in a probably bad way, <laughs> but um, funding-wise and where everyone's curious about. Um, we have with climate change and everything we have, we see diseases are spreading. So mm -hmm. those diseases would include like dengue, Zika, chikungunya, things like that. Um, it is common to stay in the same disease, but um, so I think we kind of get, some people want to focus more on the immune system versus focusing on um, like they take different components. So the immune system in the context of different viruses, or if they want to study different components of HIV. So people try definitely to diversify. Um, are there thoughts? Yeah. Okay. So Margaret Lewis, you asked a great question. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> what I've been working on right now. So I've actually made other combinations. It's kind of like a Frankenbeck situation in the lab for me right now, making <laughs> all different combinations. And I have some that are even better. It's pretty exciting. Um, so yes, we are definitely trying to make other combinations because I think I could do better. And that's what I've, um, that's what I've been like working on right now. So do you think like uh, ultimately there could potentially be some, some kinds of gene therapy that would pump up people's apobex or? Yeah, I think there definitely could be something. Um, it's definitely hard and we would wanna do all those experiments um, in the like in our cell culture models where we have virus um and these cell like ex cells that express our proteins over long periods of time because like i we talked about hiv mutates so well and so adaptive so i mean it would be a dream but uh we still have like it's pretty far it's a long way that. yeah somebody yeah. asked um do you have any ideas about why they are so successful Oh, actually uh, my super, my new super duper, it's like I'm running out of <laughs> names for these, <laughs> but um, I actually, I don't know. Um, I have just started these experiments. So the labs were shut down for a while at the Hutch and we just got like approval a couple weeks ago to go back. Um, so I have genuinely no idea. And that's kind of what's been so fun in the lab. I have lots of different experiments going on and trying to see are they better mutators of DNA or are they doing something new? Somebody asked about the assay. How do you determine the individual cells were infected with HIV during your experiments? That's awesome, I didn't talk about that. Um, so the HIV virus that we use um, actually has what we call a reporter in it, but it has a luciferase gene inside of it. And so when we add a re luciferase reagent, every cell that has been infected with HIV will glow and we're able to quantify it that way. Mm -hmm. From fireflies originally. Yep. Yeah. yeah. There's another question from Danielle. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, okay, so apobex are also rapidly evolving. And in what in response to viral mutations, is that right? So how long would you expect a new apobex to evade BIF? So that's a great question. HIV, every single time it replicates, there is one about one mistake made. And the mutations that apobex undergo the like lifespan of humans is we're talking millions of years to create these changes so yes um, these apobex are under rapid evolution but we have to think about it in the, a, t a different time scale it's not like in a lifespan but we're talking millions of years so i think it would take a very long time for a new apobex to evade fifth just because of that has the apobex structure been solved yeah, so some of them have, like APOBEC 3C has been solved. Mm -hmm. APOBEC 3H has, the single domains have, but the ones that have two domains haven't been solved. They're too difficult so far. Mm -hmm. 
Are the domains completely identical? No, they're not. And that's, um, they're actually about 40% identical. Mm -hmm. And so over time they've evolved, we've learned to specialize in certain things. And so that also adds another component of complexity to designing these new proteins. But yours is, is identical. Mine is the only one that's identical. Yeah. yeah. Good. We have time for maybe one more. One or two more. Great questions. Very interesting. Yeah, this is awesome. <laughs> All right. Looks like we are, are good. So um, let me just switch back here if you could. Let me switch back to my screen. Um, and, um, so as um, Molly mentioned, next week we have Dr. Allie Black, um, who has worked in the Bedford lab. And um, the Bedford lab has been getting a lot of press, as you know, um, from kind of their role in understanding uh, how viruses evolve and, and spread and their ability to uh, use science to track that, especially um, now for, co for the SARS-CoV-2, but a whole host of other viruses as well. And so her, uh, and it's kind of interesting, all these um, talks have, have had a, a thread connecting one to the next. And so uh, a lot of what we know about how um, some of these viruses are evolving and spreading it comes from this kind of genetic epidemiology. So kind of using epidemiological uh, techniques in combination with our understanding of what's happening on genomic level. Um, so genetic, genomic epi epidemiology on the front line, learning a bit about disease transmission from pathogen genome sequences. So that promises to be really um, interesting and we're excited about that. Uh, if you need a grad student who, to talk to your students, we have a couple grad students who um, are looking specifically to do that kind of service right now. So please email us um, if, if you're interested in that. Um, they want to meet teachers. They are excited about this possibility. Uh, we have coming up next week uh, a PD about teaching SEP labs virtually um, on May 18th. So I hope you can join us for that. And then um, as with last time, there is the feedback form um, that we hope you'll give us um, some feedback on how this went for you. And um, let's thank Molly for an amazing talk and appreciate uh, this chance to, to learn a little bit more about your work. And, um, you know, just uh, excited for your next steps. So, um, and, and thanks also for sharing about how SEP teachers um, impacted you, because I think um, that's an important thing for teachers to remember uh, through the program that often, you know, it's, it's the uh, teachers have a lot to offer to um, scientists as, as professionals, as well as the other way around. So really thank you for, um, you know, elevating that in your presentation, really appreciate it. Sweet. Thanks, Molly. Yay, Molly. Thanks, Molly. <laughs>